this ICA briefing with a very special guest, Foreign Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, I don't think there is anybody in Israel who has accumulated such experience in foreign defense affairs over two decades or more as a Prime Minister Netanyahu, having served not only, of course, as Prime Minister of Israel, but as Foreign Minister, as Minister of Finance, as Ambassador of the United Nations, Deputy Foreign Minister, and uh, other key roles in the Israeli foreign and defense policy establishment. As a Minister of Housing. Minister of Housing? You had that? Maybe for two weeks. Two weeks, okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> there's always something you miss. In any event, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been warning for um, more than a decade about the challenge of Iran. He actually warned about terrorism way before people even knew the name Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda back in the late 1970s, but in the 1990s it was Iran that was the central issue that he was speaking about, speaking about uh, the developments in their uh, international rocket program, in their nuclear program, and today, of course, there's probably no more issue that's central on the international agenda at the United Nations, in the European Union, in Washington, and capitals around the world. With that said, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Prime Minister Netanyahu. Thank you. Tadaba. Thank you, Dorit. Good morning to you all. We're coming to uh, a place and a time where the responsible powers of the world have to decide on uh, a fateful decision that will affect uh, every one of the countries that are represented here by you and in many others as well. Uh, I want to go back to the two pivotal dates that I think shape what is happening now. Uh, in many ways, uh, people are still fixed or fixated on uh, a model of uh, the Middle East and perhaps global politics that has now become pretty much obsolete. And they fail to understand that uh, for the last quarter of a century or so, uh, we are in the midst of a, a different conflict altogether. Uh, that conflict uh, is a result of the coming to the surface of long-held resentments and beliefs and aspirations of uh, a section of Islam. Uh, the uh, militant uh, believers who were essentially subdued and subjected to uh, first foreign rule uh, and then to uh, apostate rule, if you will, uh, once the Arab world got rid of the colonial powers. The great hope that the believers could assume power and deliver uh, a corrective to the historical decline of uh, Islam as they see it and the rise of the West, uh, that this could uh, be corrected once uh, the uh, Islamic world achieved independence. The Islamic world, certainly the Arab world, achieved independence after World War II. Uh, Arab and Islamic regimes came to power and they failed to deliver the goods. Many of them were seen as uh, lackeys of uh, the West. They certainly didn't develop uh, uh, theocratic regimes on the mode uh, that these uh, militants expected. So that resentment merely continued to simmer. And the real crack in the surface, the real time, the only, the first time that the Earth's surface cracked and these forces that had been simmering for centuries, really, and certainly throughout the 20th century, could break loose uh, with great power was the victory of the uh, uh, Ayatollah regime, the displacement of the Shah in 1979. Uh, and there you had the first time that an, an overtly Islamic uh, republic was established uh, by uh, believers, for <coughs> believers. Uh, and this was, of course, a pivotal event that began to shape history, began to shape history. Uh, this coming, of course, from the Sunni side of uh, Islamic militants. The second time was a, day, a decade later with the victory of the Mujahideen uh, in uh, 1979 in Afghanistan, which uh, fathered al-Qaeda and brought the Sunni stream of militancy. So yeah, sorry? The second in, in Iran, it was the Shiite. In, uh, uh, a decade later, it was the Sunni. So within a span of 10 years, there were two great victories. One, the displacement of the Shah, a uh, Western uh, lackey, uh, and then in their view. And then uh, 10 years later in uh, Afghanistan, a victory over the other great superpower, and the rise of these two, uh, two uh, streams of militant Islam, 
competing with each other, but often also colluding with each other. Uh, and now history begins to move, and diplomacy begins to move. And the earlier models that we have are being swept aside. Soon you have Afghanistan uh, control, Iran is obviously control, uh, the uh, web of terror that is spawned by that. And of course the uh, current thing that we see is the attempt to overtake the implantation of Palestinian politics with the uh, Islamic militancy. It's already been taken over by the Islamists, the threat to Lebanon of being taken over through Hezbollah, uh, and uh, the threat to other regimes that are happening. So there is a, a slow, not so slow, steady steamrolling of other conflicts that are being swept aside uh, in favor of the march of this militancy. What does this militancy want, and what is it going to do to us today? And what should we do in the face of its challenge? What it wants to do is, uh, is basically uh, correct the last 500 years. This is what it wants to do. I mean, the retreat of Islam and the rise of uh, the West was a mistake. Uh, it has to be corrected. It can be corrected by earthly power. To get earthly power, you need power. And power is military power, economic power, political power. But uh, the first uh, and foremost is the ability to get your hands on uh, and very powerful weapons. This is the confirmation that Allah, with his providential uh, grace, is favoring the militants. The most important power is, uh, is obviously nuclear weapons, if you can get it. Uh, and what we have in Iran is the uh, vindication of this belief through the, A, the controlling of a state, even though it's a minority regime, uh, not a democratic one either. It regularly uh, kills, executes, and it's, uh, uh, but it is racing and marching to achieve nuclear weapons. Uh, it is true that an equally virulent result could uh, have happened had Al-Qaeda had nuclear weapons. Uh, it's important to understand that if they have these weapons, uh, the kind of uh, militancy that we're dealing with would probably use them. I have no doubt, for example, that, uh, uh, that uh, Bin Laden would have uh, destroyed uh, Manhattan, Washington, London, whatever without any compunction whatsoever. It is uh, equally important to understand that Ahmadinejad, though he is not uh, hunted as a terrorist, uh, is, uh, uh, can equally uh, use or threaten to use these weapons in ways that no other nuclear power has done up to them. This is not a conventional nuclear power. Uh, once it has nuclear weapons, it will be deterred. It is not conventional because it's basically a messianic apocalyptic cult. It's important to understand this. Uh, normal movements do not smash into buildings in Manhattan and commit uh, collective suicide. That doesn't happen. There is a pathological strain to militant Islam in either its Shiite or Sunni varieties that is, uh, has suicidal elements, the cult of blood, the cult of death, and the cultivation of fantasy, fantasy ideology that they believe in. And this is what makes them very, very different from anyone else. I was asked in the United States, so what's the big deal if... Uh, the militant Islamists acquire nuclear weapons. After all, the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. Today, Russia and China have nuclear weapons, and other powers have it. So what's the big deal? And I said, well, uh, to an American audience, this is something that uh, resonates, I suppose. I said, well, a few years ago, you had uh, this cult that uh, took over a ranch in Texas, in Waco, Texas. Uh, the uh, Branch Davidians, they had a messianic leader David Koresh, he said he would have to destroy the United States and rebuild the world anew. He would, of course, be the uh, coming Messiah. And uh, uh, <coughs> wanted to do this with violence, using uh, about 200 of his disciples who were holed up in this ranch in Texas uh, and with rifles. The FBI surrounded them and killed every last one. I said, now imagine, he was called the, the Wacko from Waco, crazy man from Waco. Now imagine this man escaping with his disciple, taking over a country, and developing nuclear weapons. Now you understand how dangerous uh, the development of Iranian uh, nuclear weapons by this cult within a cult. This is a sect within a sect that seeks to develop <coughs> nuclear weapons to use them. Certainly to threaten with them, as uh, they have not ever been used, and also to use them. And for this goal, the Ahmadinejad regime uh, which is, uh, is perceived.
pursuing this goal uh, systematically uh, in the face of the entire world opposition. It has taken about 10 years for the world to realize uh, what kind of a threat this is. It has uh, been diverted by other pursuits, wrong pursuits, not realizing that whatever you do with the Palestinians, they'd be overrun if Iranian power goes up. Whatever you do with Lebanon and with others, they'd be overrun if Iranian power uh, triumphs. Whatever you want to do in the Gulf, if Iran has nuclear weapons, it'll overrun the Gulf. It'll probably get control of the key oil supplies of the world. It would threaten other regimes in the area. It would certainly steamroll uh, Middle Eastern politics as it already has, uh, militant Islam already has steamrolled uh, Palestinian politics. Uh, it would definitely threaten my country. It's doing so openly. Uh, and may I actually use those weapons against us or against uh, someone else. And it is actually thinking of developing weapons that will enable them to threaten everyone, just about it. I saw the list of countries, just about every country represented in this room. Uh, a few days ago, they fired, a, they tested a, 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 an orbital, a suborbital uh, uh, rocket. Once they have that capability, whether for satellites or anything else, once you can get, once you can boost your way up there, then you're uh, en route to ICBMs, and that's where they're heading. I've said a long time ago, that they wish to have by 2012, and certainly by 2015, they wish to have uh, ICBMs that could reach the United States. That means if you take a radius, it's a very wide radius, because you can use that weaponry far and wide. And they want to get to a point where they have uh, uh, the capacity to produce uh, about uh, 20 uh, nuclear Hiroshima-sized bombs a year, which means that in 10 years, uh, they could have an arsenal of 200 bombs and the weapons to deliver them practically to any place on earth. And this is an Islamic, messianic, extreme Islamic, uh, messianic, <coughs> apocalyptic movement. So this is a threat that the world does not see. I've often compared uh, Ahmadinejad to Hitler, but I make the corrective that uh, Hitler embarked on a world conflict and then sought to develop nuclear weapons, whereas Ahmadinejad is doing the reverse. The question is, what do we do about it? And up till recently, the answer is, was nothing. We were doing nothing. That's what was being done. Now, people often say, and I've said it, it's 1938, and Iran is Germany, and it's racing to develop nuclear weapons. And Condoleezza Rice said, no, it's not 1938 because we're not treating Iran passively. Well, that's the test. We're not treating Iran the way we treated Germany. That is precisely the test. Are we a collective group? talk about the Jewish people separately, but are we as the responsible international community treating this common threat, because it's a threat to all of us, Arabs and Jews, Muslims and non-Muslims, anybody who doesn't conform to their twisted definition of a pure believer is in danger. The Arab regimes are in danger, uh, non-fanatic Muslims are in danger, and everyone else, so the, uh, Israel and uh, in the West and so on. And, and they make it very clear, by the way, Israel is the first stop. They're not going to be satisfied with such a small gain. The victory over Zionism is merely a step towards the victory of uh, reestablishing this uh, fantasy empire. Uh, as they say, it has to be reconstituted from, uh, uh, from Persia to uh, Spain, <coughs> first instance. Now, can people actually believe these things? I mean, is it possible that this is only meant for internal consumption, as they said of another ideologue? And the answer is, not only do they believe in it, they die for it. They sacrifice for it, themselves and others happily. And therein lies the great danger. This pathological, irrational element is what is so dangerous. Uh, loose in the world, it could uh, do terrible things. Among other things, it would probably ignite, but may have already ignited, for all I know, uh, the, the, a nuclear arms race within this powder keg of the Middle East. Now, mind you, if the Middle East has several countries developing nuclear weapons, one of them will go off, sure as day. And what that does in the world uh, is something that uh, you can uh, postulate for yourself. So this is, this is a major threat to the international order, to international peace and security 
to the uh, supply of uh, oil from the Middle East, to the resurgence of Islamic terror, bolstered, the adherence would be bolstered enormously by this uh, growth in the, in the militant Islamic power. That's the bad news. The good news is it can be stopped. It can be stopped because this regime can be stopped. It is a lot weaker internally than it appears. First of all, most of the people don't like it. It is held uh, in power by brutal power. And it is vulnerable because Iran e economically is very vulnerable, as you know. They have uh, cut their oil production by 10% in the last uh, three years. Each year, I believe, 10%. Uh, and that is uh, not because they want to, it's because they need, desperately need, new investment in their key, uh, key crop. This is almost a single crop economy, oil. And that requires massive investments. Those investments uh, <coughs> are coming primarily from Western countries, uh, like uh, the French company Total. I just visited France and talked about it there. there uh, uh, German companies, British companies, uh, who are keeping uh, afloat this uh, economy. Uh, the American government has begun to act primarily from the Treasury Department's curtailment of banking activities. But equally, I think it's very important to use right now whatever leverage we can to uh, put economic pressure on this regime and to connect in people's minds inside Iran, something, a process that has already begun in the last few weeks and months, that Iran's additional economic hardships come from the fact that this regime under Ahmadinejad is pursuing a mad policy that is hurting the citizens of Iran directly economically because he's exacerbating the problems. First of all, they have uh, problems because their economy is twisted, uh, is corrupt, and diverts, uh, uh, and doesn't, is not free, and doesn't allow the natural growth that, that happened in Iran. But equally, uh, they're going to curtail investments and economic activities because of Ahmadinejad's uh, uh, genocidal uh, policies openly proclaimed. Genocidal in two ways. One, denying the first genocide, against the Jewish people, and two, and second, promising a new one uh, at the same time. I think it's possible to make a very uh, powerful coalition uh, to stop a lot of the economic activity of uh, uh, firms, non-American firms, I may say, non-American firms, uh, because according to U.S. law, you cannot trade with Iran. Uh, and what uh, I've been encouraging in my context uh, the United States is a divestment, divestment uh, uh, activity um, of U.S. state pension funds, which are a very large factor in the uh, investment, the global investment market. For example, uh, California has a state pension fund for state workers in California. They have a pension fund of about two hundred billion dollars. If this pension fund called CalPERS pushes, uh, divests its holdings from uh, companies that do business with Iran, those companies lose their ratings anyway. Their cost of credit goes up immediately. Plus, they lose, they actually lose a component of their equity. Uh, and that is, uh, that is very powerful. I've spoken to Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, and he's, uh, he says that he's exploring this, he's trying to advance this. I spoke to a state senator in Georgia uh, last week, and a day later, I was very happy to learn that they had passed in the Georgia uh, legislature a decision to divest the Georgia State Pension Fund from Iran. Uh, similarly, I had this discussion with the treasurer of uh, Massachusetts to advance that. It's already been done by the state treasurer of Missouri. Uh, and so there's a movement that uh, has begun, and I intend to be in the United States uh, this month in March and uh, continue to advance that. I think that anyone who says we have to act against Iran, here's a perfect way to act. It. Uh, may or may not nullify stiffer actions, but it's the first thing that you want to do, and you know you're hitting on a very vulnerable point, because this regime is causing economic havoc, and the more people understand that it is their genocidal policies that are creating an international economic reaction that people in Iran, the ordinary citizens of Iran, understand that there's a connection between Ahmadinejad's extremism and their own personal malaise. It's very important to do that. 
I think it's possible to broaden a co to create a very broad coalition in the United States between liberals and conservatives uh, across the political divide, because um, uh, the prob along the problem of gen genocide, there's uh, mass killings, genocide, if you will, in Darfur, uh, and there is uh, there are resolutions to divest from uh, from the Sudan. Well, divest from the Sudan, divest from Iran. This could uh, tie Democrats and Republicans together in an election season, I think it's very, very important. Not be merely because it's an election issue, but because it's a real issue. An issue of, uh, uh, of uh, human values and a, an issue of uh, our common security. And this kind of uh, action, from my vantage point, when I was ambassador to the UN, I could see how the UN resolutions, which had their place vis-a-vis -vis the apartheid regime in South Africa, they did their work. But the thing that really had an impact well, during the time that I was there was the growing divestment campaign against uh, the South African regime. That had tremendous impact. And this, uh, this action is important. Uh, equally important is an action that Dori uh, and Dani Naveh began to uh, uh, press for bringing Ahmed and Ijad and uh, other uh, people, international juries, uh, a meeting in New York and uh, we had meetings in the House of Commons. Uh, to bring Ahmadinejad to justice under the Anti-Genocide Treaty of 1948. It bans not only the practice of genocide, but the incitement to genocide. And Ahmadinejad is clearly guilty of that. Uh, you may get him to be put on a watch list, if not brought to The Hague, at least put on a watch list. And this delegit delegitimizes his regime and his tactic and his ideology, and that too is part of this component. Uh, judicial action, economic sanctions, Diplomatic actions, I've sp spoken to uh, a number of uh, Western leaders, including uh, Nicolas Sarkozy the other day, and I said that I think that France has to adopt a very potent policy. It remains to be seen what will be France's policy following this election. Uh, but I, I think it's important to press on everyone who is in a position of influence and power. So I, I think this, this activity to bring, for now, non-military pressure on the current Iranian regime is very potent. One, it may work by arresting the program or by bringing a change in the regime. Two, if it doesn't work, at least it will create common ground for everyone to say that we have tried. Now, it is true that the United States has uh, uh, expressed itself on this uh, issue the last few weeks, and I think this is very important. It complements, in fact, creates a, a very powerful backdrop for what we're talking about. But I think this is the central issue of our time, uh, and I think that it should not, uh, we should not be diverted by lesser issues or derivative issues. We want to make peace with the Palestinians. I do. I will. If I have, uh, if I return to the leadership of uh, this country, I will do every effort to do that. But I know that if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, it will have the power to, uh, I would say, to, uh, to uh, bring down or collapse uh, or shred any peace treaty that we have with the Palestinians. Uh, it would make the finding of a partner, <coughs> the keeping of a partner, virtually impossible because they actually control. Hamas came back from... Uh, Ismail Aniyah came back from a recent visit to Tehran. He said, Iran is our strategic backbone. He refuses to recognize the rights of Israel, the right of Israel to exist. His patron country refuses to do the same. And so if Iran has nuclear weapons, this will be magnified, and it will put under, uh, under uh, great threat the, it would make impossible new peace treaties uh, or the emergence of moderate uh, partners amidst uh, Palestinians, and it will jeopardize existing treaties that we have with other countries like Jordan and Egypt. It's just a question of time. You can see this in advance. This is what the Americans call, the Americans call uh, in, the, in their horrible jargon, the nonetheless correct uh, perception. It's called a tipping point. If Iran has nuclear weapons, things will not continue in the same way. It will not be the incremental development of this or that tendency. It will be a sudden break in reality, a sudden shift in reality that would give this regime longevity and put all of us in great jeopardy. If we want to move the Israeli-Palestinian peace process 
stop Iran. It's not, this is actually the, the proper relationship. You have to bring down Iran's proxies because with Hamas we're not going to move very far. It is not so much that if you make a deal here, you will stop Iran there. It's if you stop Iran there, you'll make a deal. That is beginning to sink. People are beginning to understand this. But the important thing to understand is that for a quarter of a century, these, this great force has emerged from under the surface of the earth like a, a poison geyser. You know, it's spurting its poison gas uh, in a very uh, large radius. And this has to be stopped before it arms itself with the weapons of mass death. I think it can. I have no doubt that militant Islam will, uh, will be defeated because of the information, uh, because of the information uh, uh, revolution, because, uh, because Arabs and Muslims are human beings, and because they crave for their children and for themselves a, a real life, uh, and they don't uh, necessarily want to, to, uh, to sacrifice it for the trappings of a twisted Muslim heaven. Uh, but until that happens, as other virulent forces were defeated in, uh, in history, including recent history, by the forces of uh, freedom and pluralism, but the cost was enormous. We cannot afford to go through that same uh, experience. People often say, with common, they nod their heads and they said, of course, the mistake in the 1930s was that uh, Hitler should have been stopped, and we would have acted otherwise. Yeah? Prove it. Prove it now. Prove it now, because there's something exactly that happening. There's a Hitlerian uh, movement, a thousand-year-old Islamic Reich, militant Islamic Reich that they're trying to create, actually to recreate, to bring back uh, a messiah of old, and to recreate this empire now. It's right in our faces. It is arming itself. It's racing. Condoleezza Rice says it's not 1938. I'll be the first to see that we can prove it, because we are armed with knowledge. For the Jewish people, this means that we have to act to lay down our own defenses, but we also have to act in the international forums in ways the Jewish people did not do. They didn't mobilize governments, they didn't have meetings like this, they didn't uh, harness uh, judicial uh, and uh, economic means, and they certainly didn't have a state to uh, create the mechanisms of self-defense. But the question for us, for me today, is what is the international community doing? What are other countries doing in the face of this challenge? If it's not 1938, prove it by acting. It is uh, different, not because of the magnitude of the threat, the acerbity of the, uh, of the regime, the, the uh, volatility and mad, uh, mad ideology that guides it, and the potential of mass death. All of it is there. The only difference is that we are forearmed with knowledge. And what do we do about that knowledge? What do we do? How do we act to stop this threat to our common civilization? And this is the question that I pose before you today, and I'm saying it can be done. It can be done by economic sanctions. It can be done by political pressures. If need be, it will be done with stiffer measures. But let's begin with what we can begin. Let's do it now. We have about 15, 20 minutes for questions. Um, do we have the mobile microphone available? <coughs> I'm going to ask people to do is identify themselves, uh, and uh, just for the record, and Steve, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mr. <laughs> Steve Erlanger from the New York Times. Oh, sorry. And I just I wanted to ask you about a different bit of American jargon, maybe paradigm shift. I don't know. If you shift. Yeah, that's, that's even worse than If the Americans <laughs> claim that, maybe Descartes did it originally. But what if Iran. Did Descartes, Descartes use paradigm shift? I read Descartes. No way that he would use it. <laughs> uh, what if Iran, um, as some people think likely, uh, never says one way or another what it's doing? never says that it's actually reached the threshold of um, nuclear weaponry, 
it takes on an Israel-like policy of ambiguity. Um, would that have the same quality of tipping point or, or a paradigm shift as an open declaration of nuclear capability? I think, Steve, there are, there are two issues that you're asking. One is the reality. Do they have it or do, do they not? And second, do they declare it or flaunt it or threaten it? using these weapons. First of all, we'll know if they have it. We may not know everything that they're doing to get it. We know what we know, and what we know is enough. They're racing uh, to get it. Uh, it's not that uh, they don't have obstacles or problems. It's technologically not so simple. It's not what you read. Uh, you, know, that, you know, a few students uh, browse the web, get the manuals, and do it. There's a very uh, complicated and precise engineering required to, uh, to produce a, a, a nuclear device. Uh, and the most complicated one is not the weaponization, but the actual production of the uh, fissionable material. The weapon can be more, the weapon is essentially a big bomb surrounding a nuclear core. That's basically what it is. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the, then that too is difficult, but not that important and not that difficult. Whereas the production of a nuclear uh, material is require certain stages, certain technologies, of which we are aware, we, are, we can track. Now, it's very important for me to say this given the controversy that surrounded Iraq. I was in the Israeli uh, security cabinet on the eve of the second Iraq war, and we asked, I asked, do they have uh, weapons of uh, mass destruction? And, they, and our people said very openly, we don't know, we're guessing that they have it. In this case, we're not guessing. We're getting guided tours. You know, uh, these are not fake centrifuges. Uh, guided tours courtesy of uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad himself. It's very important to understand that these are fundamentally uh, separate uh, issues. So, uh, situations. So, there's no question that Iran is racing to produce uh, nuclear weapons. It is, uh, occasionally it has some uh, obstacles in this race, but it is moving. Uh, and regardless of these obstacles, it is overcoming them or circumventing them and moving forward. And we will know if they have it. We may not know uh, how fast they, they will get it, but when they have it, we will know. Okay? I think reasonably, uh, uh, I'm saying this with reasonable uh, uh, certainty. Now, with reasonable confidence, I think. Now, uh, the second question, so there's not going to be a question of ambiguity in the sense of do they possess the weapons. Now, do they shift to a different mode? Well, for them to shift to a different mode means that you probably have to have a different regime there, or certainly a different cult controlling this regime, because this, uh, it seems to me that right now, given Iran's enormous problems, enormous internal problems, the only thing that is really keeping this regime in place is uh, the flaunting and vaunting of, uh, of, uh, of nuclear weapons. In many ways, it's similar to the internal rot that preceded the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union probably uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Matthew Price, BBC News. Um, uh, you said earlier, if this doesn't work, i.e. economic sanctions, political action, um, we can all at least say we've tried. At what point do you think it becomes necessary if the current Iranian uh, administration got hold of nuclear weapons? At what point would it, in your mind, become necessary to launch military action to, to get rid of those weapons? Well, before they have it. Uh, and I think, I think it would be... Now, this may come strange. Uh, this may sound strange coming from me, but it seems to me that the, why rush to a nuclear, uh, to a, a, a military attack on nuclear facilities if you can use other means. Uh, but you have to use them quickly. The economic means have, have the advantage, the economic means I described have the advantage of being very, very fast, the way markets work. If you can get uh, 20, 30, uh, shall I say 50 pension funds in the United States uh, uh, withdrawing uh, their holdings from Iran, this would have an immediate, enormous Im impact. You have to know how the international, the global economy works today. This is powerful. 
very powerful and very quick, very, very quick, because everything is interconnected. It begins to affect also the Iranian, there's a, a class of businessmen now in Iran who are, you know, tens and tens of thousands of businessmen who are uh, keeping this uh, economic entity alive. They're going abroad and so on. And all of a sudden they see the horizons closing. Uh, and this is something that has impact in, in Iran politically, without a doubt, and perhaps not only politically. Uh, so I think it's important to try non-military means. How much time do we have? Um, our uh, uh, chief of Mossad has said uh, we have three years. Tops. Okay, there are other estimates, but I think most people would agree that's from what we know that is um, not unreasonable. Three years, it could be also two years. I heard now in my visit to France somebody saying it's a lot closer than you think. I don't know, based on what I've been the briefings I receive, but I can give you the estimate given by the chief of Mossad publishing. But even three years is a thousand days, and a day has just gone by, this day. So we don't have a lot of time, and it's important to amass those pressures now uh, as quickly as possible, uh, although I don't think uh, one should uh, uh, should neglect the other possibility in case these measures do not work, and it seems to me from what uh, at least I hear publicly from the United States. Uh, what I hear and what I see that uh, people are thinking along those lines in the United States. May I, may I just ask a supplementary? Yeah. Um, is the time frame also perhaps contingent on the, the current U.S. presidency? Um, I hope not. I hope not. I hope this uh, transcends uh, uh, domestic American politics. It should. It should actually transcend uh, international uh, classic uh, international rivalries between states and so on. It really is, should unify here a very large portion of the Earth's uh, peoples. Um, a good case in point is that I think this has superseded the Arab-Israeli conflict and the is uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict because a lot of Arab countries right now are saying if you ask them what is their top priority, they will tell you. They may not tell you publicly, but they'll tell you pri privately, many of these governments, that their top priority is to stop Iran. This creates the possibility of tacit and sometimes not so tacit alliances between Israel and, uh, uh, and uh, governments in the Arab world or uh, uh, Israel and uh, moderate Palestinians. I think it's really an understanding of uh, uh, that there's a, a battle here between moderates and extremists, except the extremists are, will win the day, uh, at least for a while, if they are armed with nuclear weapons, and everybody understands that. So I think that. Uh, I think that it is, uh, if, if it is breaking apart uh, political divides here, the, the understanding of this great threat, uh, it should uh, certainly break apart, uh, uh, break open uh, uh, political rivalries in the United States. This should not be an election issue. It should be a dividing rather, a, 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 a uniting rather, a dividing issue. And by the way, it's totally irrelevant from the conflict in uh, Iraq, from the, from the political debate over Iraq, because whether you stay or whether you leave, whether you uh, uh, set a timetable for departure or you don't, whether you uh, have a surge of forces or you have a decline of forces, if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, you will lose Iraq, for sure. And in my opinion, you will lose most of the Middle East and many other things will be in jeopardy. So this should not be, uh, this should not be part of the internal uh, American-U.S. debate, American debate, presidential debate or other. Hannah Berry is from the BBC Latin American Service. Mr. Daniel, <coughs> where do you see Israel in all this scenario regarding what should be done, the way it should participate mm -hmm. in a coalition when we are talking for the time being only about non-military measures and also when we pass the threshold and the military aspect should be tackled. Well, first of all, uh, uh, for the interest of full disclosure, yes, I think my country is being threatened and yes, I'm trying to galvanize as many forces around the world uh, to, uh, uh, to head off that uh, threat. I would have said the same in the 1930s about uh, 
uh, Hitler's regime. Yes, it was threatening the Jews, but that was only the first step. They then threatened uh, and indeed uh, caused the death of tens of millions of people. Um, and uh, in similar vein, I think that uh, uh, we should make it clear Israel is merely on the front lines of this uh, maelstrom of what uh, could uh, turn out to be a global tsunami if Iran, uh, if Ahmadinejad's regime acquires uh, atomic bombs. So first let's put it openly. We're not uh, trying to not trying to hide it and not trying to deny it. For God's sake, they openly say, uh, as they deny the Holocaust, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, wipe you from the face of the earth. So it's the first thing that we have to do is be open about it and say, we don't want that to happen and we'll do whatever we can. I hope I'm doing everything I can to make it not happen. And now having said that, I'm not creating here an artificial alert. Anybody in his right mind can understand that this is a global force a global malevolent force that merely sees Israel as the first uh, stepping stone in its march to uh, to uh, world conquest and world domination. Uh, twisted and as improbable as this thought is, uh, that's the way these people think. It's very hard. It's very hard for in the post enlightenment period. It's very hard for the world, not only for Westerners. It's very hard for the world to believe that you can have modern religious wars because the last one really was extinguished about 150 years ago, okay? But in the time scale of militant Islam, this is nothing. It's the blinking of an eye. They have to correct. The first assault on the West from the West failed. The second assault on the West from the East in the great bat naval battle in Lepanto failed. The third assault in Vienna failed. This is the fourth assault, except it's much more insidious and much more powerful, and it uses many, many aspects. But the most important thing is it uses nuclear weapons. It is important to understand that people think like that. They think differently from the way we think. Okay? So, yes, they intend to get us, but we're merely a small city. Europe is the middle-sized city. The United States, I hope it's not offended, but the United States is the great city. And we have to, uh, we have to put it in, in exactly that perspective. We're number one, only in time. And you, all of you follow in various ways. And so the question is, uh, what is our role? Our role is, first of all, to protect ourselves. This is our main lesson from our past mm -hmm. tragedy. But our role is also to alert others to the danger. Uh, but it cannot be just uh, our effort, or even in the name <coughs> our effort. Just as the previous uh, mad ideology was not a Jewish issue, and if there had been an, Israel, an Israeli issue, it's a world issue, it's a civilizational issue. And I draw that a, a total distinction with other, uh, what are called conflicts, but are really competition of civilizations, to use Huntington's uh, uh, example. Okay, you use the seven or eight civilizations that are in conflict with each other. No, they're competing with each other. They're trying competing primarily economically, and they'll translate this into political and military power, but they're competing within an accepted range of conflict, especially when it comes to nuclear weapons. They all know what to do, and especially they know what not to do. They've proven it. They have these weapons for decades, and nothing nothing of the kind of what we see today is happening there. There is only one force right now that really threatens our common civilizations, only one, and that's militant Islam. It doesn't play by the rules. The last time we had somebody come in who didn't play by the rules, we saw what happened. He had to be stopped. Ahmadinejad has to be stopped before, before he does enormous damage. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Prime Minister Dan Williams from Reuters. Um, you, perhaps more than any other Israeli notable, has promoted the, the possibility of an Israeli preemptive action should it be necessary when the time comes. Um, I'm speaking of a radio interview you gave about a year ago to this effect, praising uh, your predecessor Begin at the time, and saying, suggesting that were you in a position, you would do that were that required. Um, now, clearly Israel has a pedigree in this area, but clearly this also serves as a very useful goad when it comes to, say, wavering parties in Europe who might otherwise not be so interested in imposing harsh sanctions. I'm wondering if you see that effect, and I'm talking about the secondary effect, um, wearing thin in Europe. I'm talking about recent 
statements by Chirac when he spoke about playing down the idea of an Iranian bomb. He spoke about Israel, potentially the United States, raising Tehran in response. He didn't speak about a preemptive um, Israeli action. Uh, there was the, the leaked EU report that also did not mention preemptive action. There are independent military analysts who think that the job is really too big for Israel to handle alone. And when it comes to the United States, that it's overextended in Iraq and lacks public support. Do you see, and I'm focusing specifically on Europe here, do you see that effect growing thin? Well, I think I prefer to talk about the actions that are um, in agreement uh, and should be, uh, a, you know, very wide consensus internationally, and that is uh, the political and economic uh, pressures that could be brought down on this regime with great force. I think I think there are cracks there that may not have been evident uh, a few months ago, and certainly a, a year ago. It's very clear that there is internal schisms in the regime itself. There is enormous public uh, resentment. Some of it is being expressed in meetings with students or housewives and so on. You can hear it. Uh, even in this Iran, because it's not, Iran is not hermetically closed. It's not a hermetically closed tyranny. It's a porous tyranny. You can hear the voices of, of dissatisfaction and dissent. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, before you get into this area, which is always murky by its nature, um, it's best to focus, as I'm doing now and I've been doing in the last uh, few months, on the measures, the non-military measures that could be applied. Um, there's no question that if uh, stiffer measures are needed, it's best that the United States will lead them. Ambassador? Mm. Uh, Amikaj Jantowski, the Czech Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, there are three present or future great powers in the close neighborhood and proximity of Iran, Russia, India, China. And it could be argued that no system of sanctions, economic or otherwise, will be effective uh, without they being a part of the system. How do you propose to involve them? It would be a lot more effective if they were in the system, if the UN sanctions, which were adopted by the Security Council, uh, are ratchet it up, obviously it would be uh, very effective, uh, but these, A, take their time, B, have these gates that have to be passed each time and uh, require international agreement. It's important that you got this international agreement for the first time. I don't discount the, uh, if not the economic uh, significance, the, the political significance of this unity is something that I, I, I think is uh, not fully appreciated. But in terms of time, the fastest way to achieve uh, rapid impact economically is actually through non, well, not through non, but can also be, this can also be done by non-UN sanctions, by what I call selective voluntary sanctions. This means that if the pension funds do what I said, immediate impact. If certain governments do what uh, I said, the U.S. government is doing that right now through the Treasury action on uh, curtailing banking activity, very effective. These are not UN measures that are having their impact. You're feeling them. You're hearing their impact. We, uh, there's no question that they're taking their toll. So uh, would it be better if uh, uh, China, Russia, and India uh, coalesced in this wholeheartedly and did, uh, uh, did their part uh, fully? The answer is yes. Do we wait for it? No. One more question. George Bureau, Neue Zürcher Zeitung from Switzerland. Uh, Israel has a policy of nuclear ambiguity. Nevertheless, uh, many countries do see Israel as a nuclear threat. What do you say the uh, preventive actions that you suggest, economically, banking, judiciary, they could be used against Israel as a preventive measure? Uh, there is a, often a, in this type of discussion, a, confusion between uh, means and ends. Uh, there are many means uh, that could be used, like embargo. That is a neutral means. It could be used for just reasons. It could be used for unjust reasons. But the means itself uh, is not It's value-free. It, it, it doesn't mean anything. The same is true of divestment. Uh, it could be used for good reasons or for wrong reasons. The same is true of UN resolutions. You can call Zionism racism. 
only country that ever transported black people out of Africa to liberate them and not to enslave them. You can call that racist. You can call the movement of Theodore Herzl, uh, a man who wrote, after I liberate the Jews, I'll, I'll go and liberate the blacks of Africa. You, know, you can call Zionism racism. You can do that. So UN resolutions can serve for good reasons or for bad reasons. Uh, divestments can be used for good purposes or bad purposes. Uh, that should not tell us to do nothing because somebody can abuse these means. Uh, that way, uh, good people uh, would never defend themselves against uh, bank robbers or killers because they're using guns, and so we couldn't use guns in, in response because guns are being abused. So I would, uh, I would grant that uh, people have tried and will continue to try to uh, defame and isolate uh, my country, uh, but, uh, but that should not stop us from meeting now this important, uh, this fantastic uh, threat really to all of us. Uh, I, I do want to say that I think all nuclear proliferation is bad, but some of it is a lot worse. I mean, if Holland has nuclear weapons, it's not the same as the Atola or Al-Qaeda getting nuclear <laughs> devices. <laughs> I think we've reached. I agree with that. <laughs> I want to thank. Thank uh, you all. I appreciate it. <laughs> I want to thank Prime Minister Netanyahu for joining us today for a very enlightening and very important ICA briefing. Our next briefing is with General Gallant. And that's the date is what? On the 7th. On the 7th of the next month. We'll all be getting invitations. He's commander of Southern Command. We'll be speaking about the situation in the Gaza Strip. Thank you again. Probably outlasted its demise.